Hey everybody, I'm Andy Weinberg, and welcome to episode 87 of the David Osikinen In The Pocket podcast, coming to you as always from the beautiful Wildfire Radio Studios in Woodbury, New Jersey. Taylor, as always, with us on the other side. How you doing, Dave? Yeah, I'm doing good. Can I stay out there? It's not, you know... A little humid, though. I'm feeling it. It's a little humid here in the studio. Taylor, can we get some air conditioning going, or (laughs) what's the deal here? No. You guys not paying your bills. What's going on? It's good. All good. It is. It's very good, because we have have a great guest this week, Dave, as as you well know. His name is John Worcester, and he's a fantastic drummer. He's also a very, very funny man, uh, comedian. He's done uh, the best show with Tom Sharpling for many, many years, and he's played in some incredible bands, Super Chunk, The Mountain Goats. Bob Mould, as well. And he's also played with like a million other people, too, that are all very cool. Fantastic player. He's a great... uh, uh, I was watching a video of doing a uh, festival correspondent uh, for Pitchfork, and I I was cracking up because he's just so good and comfortable at doing it. It was very good. Yeah, so Dave Dave and I are just going to kick back for the next hour and and let John just riff, (laughs) and uh, it's going to be very funny stuff. I got a lot of questions to ask him because he he grew up in... uh, Harley's Harleysville, yeah. Yeah. And, He's um, down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina now yeah. where he lives. But, uh, yeah, farm country out there, Harleysville. <laughs> yeah, a little, little bit. Well, that, well, little I mean, bit. Back, well, we'll find out. Back when he grew up. I mean, it's, it's yeah. developed now. But anyway, uh, before we get started with John, I do want to mention that we are brought to you again this week by our great friends at Croker Percussion. They got a deal. They do have a deal. Crokerpercussion.com. If yeah. you then backslash ITP, it'll give you a, um, a code for 5% off anything in the store. So uh, go on crokerpercussion.com. And as I said, then type in backslash ITP yeah. and click on the code, and you can get uh, a deal, 5% off anything. And they, they got great stuff. They're dedicated mm-hmm. to creating quality handcrafted percussion instrument, instruments with superior sound quality and unmatched craftsmanship. Uh, John, as a drummer, if you're ever back in this area, check out Croker Percussion. Great stuff. Our friend Eric Metz. Uh, and you can give him a call, too, at 215-669-8588. And as I said, be sure to use the ITP code for 5% off anything in the store. We're also brought to you again this week by our friends at the School of Rock Main Line in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, right outside Philadelphia. They're uh, combining one-on-one lessons with group performances. Great teachers like Dave. Mm, I have a ball over there. It's yeah, they do. Me and Wally. Get to Wally hang out. Smith, yeah. Great. I never see him, though, because he's across the, well, the way. I pass him in between bringing a, a new victim in. <laughs> <laughs> and they, but, they, but, yeah, they take these young musicians, and yeah. they teach them to, to feel like rock stars. And as we've said many times, some of them will become rock stars. Check we've them had out. a couple on the show. And yes, did well we for have. Check good. them out, schoolofrock.com. Yeah. Look up specifically the one in Mainline, Philadelphia. You can call them also, 610-647-2900. Okay, Dave, as I've said, and as uh, we have on the line with us from his home in Chapel Hill, the very talented and very funny John Worcester. John, how you doing? Hello. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Really good to have you. Hey, we were just talking about your, your roots a bit growing up in, uh, you grew up uh, in Harleysville, I was reading. Yes. You know. but, uh, see, I, but I knew your name from um, uh, the, uh, the guys from the Dead Milkmen because you became, I guess, uh, you know, famous through those guys uh, uh, and doing other amazing things. But uh, um, so you're in Chapel Hill now and you grew up here uh, and you've become a, a great, great drummer. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that, will you? Yes. Well, f- first, David, I, I want to say I don't want to embarrass you, but <laughs> I, I wanted to say what an honor it is to talk oh. to you. Y- you were one of the very first drummers wow. I ever saw saw in the flesh who really made an impression on wow, me. Wow, Johnny, I'm, yeah. I'm humbled. I mean, because I I love watching, like, even I love watching photos, seeing photos of you. Oh. I, and also, <laughs> I love that you, you go between match and traditional grip fluently, and it's really nice. It's something that I like to watch drummers do, and you you are a, a great drummer, and I'm humbled by that. John, I was going to ask you, and then I want to hear more about your early impressions of Dave, because you were kind of a you were kind of a punk rock kid. I mean, you were into you were into punk rock music, indie rock kind of thing, and yet Always, the, yeah. the Hooters were all over MTV and were you know by the you know by Wearing the mid colors, <laughs> yeah, kind of a, a far cry from from you know indie rock. Punk. I mean, were you were you a Hooters fan from the beginning when you first? Oh, I'm talking I'm talking pre 
pre MTV. Okay. I, um, wow. I saw you guys play. I, I feel like I saw you guys play twice at the Norris Theater, but it might just been once. Oh. And um, in Norris Town, and yeah. I think a- Andy King's band opened. Uh, oh. What are they called? Jack Jack of Diamonds. Oh my God. Yes. Man, you would go way back then. Yeah. I go way back. Yeah. yeah. So and John Kuzma, we might have been doing the ska. Mac, back oh. then, you were doing the ska, it, reggae thing. We were like, well, because we were inspired very much by indie, that, that whole yeah. like uh, two-tone, selector, uh, uh, madness, any all that stuff. That kind of float, that floated our boat. As a matter of fact, we were, we, you know, the band broke up because, you know, that thing wasn't happening anymore. And then Rob and Eric ended up working with Cindy. But but so you saw us at that, at that, at that time, which I... I totally get you digging that. Oh, totally. I mean, I didn't think of the Hooters as any different than those bands you just mentioned or, or the Ramones or the Police that all oh, kind of fit into, yeah. into that thing. Yeah. And you guys had that, had that great instrumental called Bomb Scared. You yes. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. Love that. He Holy stop, shit. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and it's a, it's based on a true a story because we were going to play the Bijou Cafe when we started and we had a bomb scare. We, I don't know if we, the show got canceled, but everybody had to leave. I, I think we uh, either came back or rescheduled, but uh, we'd write bomb scare. Oh, and then right into oh, the... Oh, so good. Oh, my God, Johnny. That's oh, incredible. And, and you guys were <laughs> my entree into, like, uh, Desmond Decker. That was the first yeah. time I ever heard the, the, yeah. the Israelites was your, your cover. Yeah. Uh, John's, yeah. John's great song, Jet Black. Remember that song? Oh, my God. Dude. So we, uh, And you... Did you meet John? Did, did you become friends with John? No, no oh. I never met any any of you guys until uh, right now. Oh my gosh! Uh, so wait, so you guys <laughs> oh have gosh. never you've never no, been in the no, same no, room? No, you no, no. Oh, that's just I crazy. Just, I've, I've I've heard the legend Johnny Worcester. So I was like, hey, you know, I uh, had to have him on the podcast. Where I've been wanting to invite you for the longest time, and you were so gracious. Said, yeah, man, let me know when. I was like, wow, cool. And uh, well, I'm I'm I'm. Honored for one, and uh, you've done pretty well for yourself. <laughs> I did all right. Yeah, I did all right. Yeah, sure have, man. John, did you know from a pretty young age you wanted to play the drums? Y- yeah, I um, what did I start out on? My parents got me a trumpet. I went to uh, wow, as you said, I, I I grew up in the farmlands of of uh, Harleysville, yeah, which is a very very Mennonite area. Right. My family was wasn't Mennonite, but it, it was a, it was pretty hardcore in that area. Yeah. And um, so, uh, I got a trumpet for the school band, probably in sixth grade, and it just wow. wasn't my thing. Yeah. And somehow my somehow my parents were okay with me learning to play the drums. And of course, when you you start, you just get that pad, and it's like yeah. it's no fun. It's no fun. <laughs> One of those remote pads, and right? That you, yes, you know, the yeah, kid, right? I, still, I, bet. I still have it. Oh, good for I you. Still, I still practice on it. Oh, good for you. And uh, so, I ended up quitting after six months, and then, amazingly, my parents ended up buying me a drum kit for my my twelfth birthday, I guess it was. Wow. And. And I can't express how grateful I am to my parents for just putting up with the racket of yeah, a, sure. terib- a uh-huh. terrible child drummer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my neighbors. Well, my you turned it neighbors, around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it paid off at least. So where so, you pra- uh, did you practice in the garage or basement? No, but, but just in the in my dad's like office, <laughs> in the so, dining room. <laughs> <laughs> these poor these poor people. Uh, and it didn't it didn't dawn on me until years later that well. they would. They would kind of pull into the driveway, hear me playing, and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back. Oh, my God. <laughs> so when did you go from terrible child drummer to decent teenage drummer? Was there one gig or was there one moment where you sort of kind of got it? Or did it just kind of um, develop over time? It developed over time. I started playing along with um, – I love those first two cl- – um, Police records. Oh, okay. Uh, Outlandos. Yeah, yeah, sure. Forgot it. Right. Yeah, and right. I, would, I would play along with those. Yeah. And then, um, and then London Calling came out. Right. And that was that's still my favorite album of all time. I, and I, so, I, it's one of my top records too. I love that. Yeah. Record. Yeah. Yeah. So I would just play along with these records, and I, I felt like I kind of got good from that, and then um, or, or or passable, and then, luckily, there was just like one guy in my high school who, uh. 
who was into this kind of music too, who played an instrument. And he played the bass, and we got this band together called wow. Hair Club Hair Club for Men. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And Hair so Club this is for 19... Men. Yeah, it, this is 1981, wow. and it was it was original songs that were kind of kind of in the ballpark of what the early Hooters were doing. Wow. Although I don't think I don't think I knew of the Hooters yet. Oh, okay. And we were playing in '80. We started in '80, and it sounds like you saw us. If you saw us with uh, Andy's band opening for us, uh, uh, it, uh, playing a gig with us, I should say, uh, it was probably in that '81, '82 because because that that was that lineup. Wow. Yeah, I think it was '82. Bobby Bobby was in the band too. Yeah. Wow. Well, right. Yeah. So um, we had this had this band Hair Club for Men. It was me. I was. 14 or 15 I, I wasn't in high school yet yeah. and then um th and um <laughs> a, a second bass player we had a fuzz bass player and a regular bass player uh, and, and, you're like deadbolt you remember you know deadbolt yes, yes. you were fucking oh, yeah. deadbolt from harleysville <laughs> harley <Yes. laughs> with the two fucking bases that's yeah. great yeah and this guy was 28 <laughs> which was wait and he's I mean, hanging out with a couple of 15 year olds yes. that's a little creepy yes. a little creepy John. but he he kind of ran the band, like because he was an adult, he could get things going, <laughs> you know. And and then the other guy was was probably twenty, and and we we all looked up to these guys because they could get into into Emerald City. Yeah, and, sure. uh, what a place that like was. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so that was the band, and we would do kind of kind of almost reggae-ish kind of pop originals, and then songs that that bands we like covered, like like yeah. the Clash doing "I Fought the Law" or, yeah. or songs that. Songs the Ramones would cover, yeah. so that that was where I kind of learned how to play. Yeah, yeah, that that that's just the blueprint. It sounds like, uh, in a lot of ways, the way I learned to play. That's that, that's that's great, man. I I, I love that. Just uh, one more story from that era of your life, John. Uh, so I was reading around 1983. I guess you would have been what 16, 17 years old, somewhere around there. And you booked the Dead Milkmen for their very first show. Is that at, at the Harleyville? Harleysville Senior Adult Activity Center? Is that is that is that a true yes, story? Yes. Also known as the SAC. Okay. I'm just trying the to picture sack. the dead milkman at the Senior Adult Activity Center. Yeah. Uh, it, it was quite well it was uh it wasn't well attended, obviously, but but uh, um they I knew Dean, the drummer, Dean right. Clean, yeah. um because his band, he had he had a, a duo called Narthex. <laughs> and Narthex opened for Hair Club for Men a few times. Just at, at parties, we would rent out VFW right. halls yeah. in Southampton, that was the thing, Southern right? PA, yeah. yeah, Lansdale. And so I, that's how I knew Dean. And we were still good friends. And then he met these guys, and they formed this band, the Dead Milkmen. In um, wow. God, where did they practice? It was um, Ridley, okay. Ridley, PA. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. And and then they would rehearse at Dean's place up in um, he either lived in Perkesee or Sellersville I think yeah. Sellersville and okay. that was close close enough to where I lived that I could go and hang out with them um, at, um in the basement and <laughs> and and kind of practice with them and I was I'm so grateful to this day that they took me under their yeah. wing that's great. and and got, and got me into like punk shows in the yeah. city and so anyway they needed a show. Uh, to play and i guess it was i guess it was their first show and <laughs> the 28 year old from hair club for men you know because he was a man he could he could rent this place out uh -huh. and so and so i guess i was the promoter but this guy actually did you know the uh the adult work that it Wait took to put you this, you were the promoter on. and you were how old how old were you were what i would say 16 maybe uh, great. all right i love <laughs> yeah. it yeah love it yeah and uh so they played and it was great, and I can't imagine there were more than twenty people there. Probably the ten kids from my high school that were into this stuff, and and they probably brought about ten of their friends from the city up. So none of the senior adults who normally hung at the senior adult activity center showed up for this event. I'm guessing. I I have to. I can't imagine there wasn't some sort of adult who opened the doors for us. Okay. <laughs> Whether or not he stuck around is is up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's great. Wow, wow. 
So it was just a few years after that that you were, uh, and we'll jump ahead to like 1986, you were in a band that was signed, right? You were in the band Right Profile, and you were signed yes. to uh, Arista Records, correct? And worked well, we, with... we, can't, we can't skip Psychotic Norman. Oh, okay. All right. We have an hour. We can hit them all. Yeah. Un utterly skippable, but but uh, um, I love it. This was a, a a band I got in through my friends in the Dead Milkmen, and um, this was like my first real band where we played real shows. And I I would take the train in. I had the the uh, I graduated high school in 1984 on a Friday. Yeah. And I st I started work in a toothpaste packaging plant that Monday. Oh. And. <laughs> On, on it, the graveyard ship. For some reason, I thought, uh, oh, I'll, I'll have all day to hang out with my friends. Oh if, boy. I, if I, you know, but like you're completely tired <laughs> all day long because you're just, yeah. you're trying to live this normal life. Right. And, but, but you have to work from eight to, to uh, or from midnight to eight. <laughs> and so I, I would do that. And then on the weekends, I would take the train in yeah. the R, the R5. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I would take the um, the L up to 69th Street, and I would meet my bandmates in front of the Tower Theater, and we would rehearse in Drexel in oh. one of our in our bass player's basement. Oh, okay, yep. And and so we were kind of like a cross between um, this band called The Fall, uh, this English band that was kind of kind of weirdo, kind of uh, angular, kind of rock. Uh, yeah. And uh, the Minutemen and the Ramones, that kind of thing. Pretty so cool. we would, we had shows in the city. We'd we'd play at um, this uh, sub shop on I think maybe 40th and Market called Abe's Steaks. Oh, I know it. <laughs> I know it. Which yeah. which it turned out was was a hangout for G Gary Heidnick. Do you remember him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Sure. He had a fun basement. Had a fun basement oh, too, yeah. right? Oh, <laughs> we didn't know it at the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, he was getting preliminary, preliminary right? That's great. He was, yes. Oh, oh my man. God. So, so we played there in places like that. We, we, uh, uh, uh Bacchanal. Remember Bacchanal sure. on South Street? Yeah. Yeah. That was we got to play the, got to play the Ripley once, oh. opening for the Dead Milkmen. But that, oh. that was the extent of our, of our, of our big gigs. I think and I so missed you. I think I, well, they, I don't know how many times they probably played Ripley's a lot, but I saw them at Ripley's one time. I saw them. In the yes. Movie. Yeah. This was their first time because a uh, a band from England called the Angelic Upstarts had canceled, oh. and so uh, remember Bobby Startup? Sure, Bobby. I, I, I saw Bobby not too long ago. Why did I think Bobby had died? He, he's alive. Oh um, well, I, I maybe you not. Know, I, I you know what? If he did, and I don't, I, I'm sure I would have heard of it. Um, but yeah. but um, I saw him when I not too long ago. It was before COVID. Um, oh. it was before COVID unless he passed away. Uh, I, I, I saw him actually, oddly enough at someone's memorial. Uh, I, forget I think he's alive. Then. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Apologies he looked, to you, oh, sorry. He looked good. He, he looked alive <laughs> when I saw him. He looked good. He was complaining. <laughs> he was totally living. Listen, man, he was complaining. I mean, Bobby was complaining about, Bo about Brian Setzer. When I saw him, he goes, he does rec like return my phone calls. <laughs> you know, the, the, the old, the old oh. relationship there, but, uh. Wow! Yeah, Bobby. At least, up. at least he got in the the stray cats behind the music. So yeah. cheers for that. Yeah, yeah, he certainly did. You know, so you played. Uh, did you ever play the the Eastside Club? Did you do the Eastside Club as well? Well, he, here's a funny story. I um, psychotic Norman. Our our first real big gig was supposed to be at the East at the East Side, and I think it closed the day before. Oh. <laughs> so we we right. didn't get to do it. Right. Yeah, uh. we didn't get to do it. I, you know, I remember going in there. I, I saw Duran Duran in the East Side Club. I think like a week yes. later they exploded. But I yeah. saw them, and it was it was like, you know, it was a scene. I saw some great bands there. I think I saw the, the Stranglers. We also played with the Stranglers at, at, at Emerald City. But I remember, I think they, they might have played there too. But uh, my friend Marty Watt was spending a lot of time there, and... A, mm -hmm. a band called Executive Slacks. You remember those guys? Oh yes. Yeah. So, uh, but it was it was always like a, a scene. Um, we I remember the Hooters played uh, East Side Club, but it was at the time. I, I, I think you know we split up, and then after we we came back with a much more poppier thing going on um, yes. because I, I guess the influence of um, you know what happens when you you make a hit record like what happened with Robert Eric with Cindy. 
everything kind of right. changed when we came back. But hey, look, I was on for the ride. Like I'm sure you know, you've experienced you know uh, things that start like happening. But uh, but those were those were fun times when you're mentioning those venues like the Bacchanal, uh, and 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 uh, the, you know we talk about the East Side Club. Did you ever play the London Victory Club? Did you play there? No, but I I, I used to tape live shows off the radio from there. Yeah. I'm sure I had a, a Hooters one. There was a great Robert Hazard one. Yes, a real good one. Yes. Hazard. Yeah, that was a, that was a good one. The, you know, it's funny the Hooters never played. Uh, we played Ripley's. And we never played, and the Hooters never played Dobbs of all places. We didn't play Dobbs. Oh, weird. We played Bijou. We played Ripley's. Um, uh, Stars. Do you remember Stars on Second and Bainbridge? I, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. But you played all I like the cool. Play I love the fact that you played Abe's the Hoagie Shop. <laughs> yes. Like, wow. yes. That's great. I saw. I saw uh, the ultimate Philly power bill at um, this month. Uh, it was at Widener. Widener's oh. in, Ch oh. in Chester, is that oh. correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Hazard. You guys, A's. Hazard, A's. Yes. And some, maybe Dick Tracy. Yeah, maybe you're ex – wow, you, <laughs> wow, you've got a great memory. And I, re I, can I, yeah. remember, I can remember all of the original Hooters names, yeah. all the heroes' names, wow. but I can't find my keys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's – well, well, it's not just the Hooters and the heroes wrinkle. either. This man, John, has – I mean, I'm just reading stuff about you online. You have an encyclopedic knowledge of popular and rock music and indie music. I mean, it's crazy you do some of these, these fun topics where you'll just rattle off like five songs that – mention other singers or something and you'll yeah. pull out these obscure songs and and uh yeah i mean is this you've always had this this thirst recall. for that's for great recall and and a thirst yeah. to learn it in the first yeah. place right is this always something that's fascinated you just the minutia of, of of bands and songs and and records well as as my ex said if john's really into something he's really into it but if he's not really into something he's really not into it so, <laughs> Does, so the, did the ex fall into the latter category is that the problem? oh I, no no we're still in good terms oh, okay. but, but she's absolutely right about that yeah <laughs> yeah that's probably served you well um so you're like uh, like daniel stern's character in diner remember do, do you know yes, yeah, daniel, yes. oh yeah <laughs> yeah yep. you know <laughs> you're, you're playing like it, it's like are you one of these guys because you certainly pl play uh, and played on a lot of stuff. When you go do, say, a session, are you a guy that is that like writing out charts and stuff, or are you a guy that shows up and says, "I'll take some notes and I'm going to go after"? What, 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 what's your thing, Johnny? I like um, for for like someone like Bob Mold. Um, yeah. Bob Bob will send us uh, uh, Jason and I. Jason's the bass player. Um, he'll he'll send us these demos. And he's got a drum machine, which is a very, right. very kind of ba basic pattern, and and maybe a vocal, maybe just like a melody, just a ah, yeah, sort uh -huh. of thing. Yeah. And the guitar and bass. And what I'll do is, first for like a week or so, I'll just listen to the songs. Yeah. And just, just kind of absorb them, and then, it, depending on how much time he gives us, uh, uh, uh to prepare. Yeah. I'll, I'll play all the songs. Like once a day, just just playing along with them, not really charting anything out. Yeah. I just want to know. Nice. I want I want it to be in the muscle yeah. memory, but I don't want to overthink it because yeah. I want there to be some magic on the day. That's great. So that's that's basically yeah. it. I love that. Yeah, that, that's it. And, and if you know, if you have the luxury of being able to do that and, and get some time, that's wonderful. That to, yeah, to me, that's that's ideal. <laughs> it's ideal to be able to do that. Wonderful. That's great. Let's hear some of John's work. You yeah. mentioned Bob Mould. Uh, you sent yeah. us a couple tracks, and one of them was The Descent from uh, Bob's album, The Silver Age, 2012. And uh, we'll just hear the beginning of the song, and then we'll fade it a little bit, and we'll continue the conversation. But...
That sounds great too. And an, an inspiring sounding track, but the, you know, drums sound like all fired up and fresh. That sounds really great. I love it. John, what really was it? Nice. I mean, you'd obviously you, you hooked up with Bob, I guess, around 2009. Um, but so you're well established at this point. You'd been with Super Chunk for 18 years at that point. But still, love, love but, that band, by but, the way. I will get into Super Chunk, but just to to join Bob Mold's band. I mean, you're talking a, a, a stone cold legend in the punk indie world. To to be part of that and to play with Bob for now since you know, like I said, 2009. What was that like for you? Um, well, you know, I um. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm still hearing the song. Is that? Yeah, that's that's yeah, okay. Is that bothering you? Should we? Oh, oh, wait, oh, oh sorry. Oh, that was... <laughs> there we go. That's great. It's just in the background there. Yeah. We, we could we could take it down, Taylor. Yeah. We could take it all the way down. I don't want to. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was asking about yeah, uh, just about being asked to, and, and playing with Bob. playing with Bob. Well, I was a giant giant fan of his first band, Husker Du, and yeah. I I saw them. Um, I, the first time I saw them was at this total dive hall on Broad and South called Love Hall. Wow. And um, that place didn't was, last very long, did it? No, no. I, I saw I saw a bunch of shows there, but it was very like, yeah. is the door going to be open for this show? <laughs> Who knows? You know. Right. And, and uh, uh. so in in December of '83, I saw them and and, and the Minutemen play yeah, there, great. and they were so so good. And I just loved Husker Du's records. I loved that they were the perfect you know amalgam of punk rock and super pop yeah, songwriting yeah. yeah and and so they were my favorite band and they're still one of my favorite bands yeah. of all time mm. and so my the story of my entree in, into bob's world is is interesting in that you ask how it felt there wasn't really time to feel anything um i'll, I'll try to be as concise about this um this would, this would have been I, I, uh, somewhere in 2008, I think. Um, I was on tour with the Mountain Goats, who, who I just joined. And um, we were playing, oddly enough, at the um, – is it called the First U Unitarian Church in Philly? There is, yeah, there yes. is a venue there called yeah, First Unitarian yeah. Church. Yeah, I know okay. what you're talking about. Yep. We were playing there, and I get a call from Jason, the bass player for Bob Mould. He, he's already in the band. And – they were having some issue with the drummer on their current tour just wasn't vibing right it just wasn't wasn't a good fit and jason said would you be able to play drums on the european leg of this tour and i said yeah i think i've actually got an, an opening there so that was kind of laid laid to rest that i would do this and then the next day he called again and he said would you be able to finish this tour <laughs> <laughs> oh whatever they, yeah, i wonder how that night before went oh well, that's that's cool <laughs> uh, yes. whoa yeah uh, apparently uh, a nightmare so oh um, boy by chance the mountain goats had this tour coming up of australia and for some reason it got canceled that day oh and oh, wow we had one more show left on this U.S. thing. It was, it was in um, D.C. And I said, you know, I feel lucky. Let's do it. And so we played the, the, the final show of the tour in D.C. And my memory is the guys in the Mountain Goats just dropped me off at home. And yeah. I showered and I, I, I slept. And I think I went to the airport the next morning. Yeah. And I told Jason, let me know what the songs are. I, yeah. I think I know how to play the Husker Du songs and – and yeah. the Sugar songs, that was the band Bob had after right. Husker right. Du. And I think I know some of his solo songs and just <laughs> anything else. Yeah. Tell me what I need to download, and I'll chart it out on the plane. Right. And so he did, and I flew out there, and they picked me up at the airport. And I spent the night in a hotel in um, West Hollywood. And we drove we drove down to Solana Beach outside oh, of San Diego. Belly up. The next day, yes. Wow. The next day, and we sound checked and played the show that night. Wow. Uh, I, I bet my friend so, Amy Amy Johnson was at that show. Oh, Good maybe, thing. maybe. Yeah. Wow. So there was there was no time to be nervous. It was just I have to do this and we'll do it. And as the tour went along, it got easier and easier. But yeah, that was that was you know getting thrown into the deep end for sure. So you never even had time for that pinch me moment. I'm no. playing in Bob Mould's band, his you know my one of my favorite bands of all time, Husker yeah. Husker Du, and now I'm playing with them, and there was never even time to kind of put it all in perspective, kind of thing. It was just 
yeah. boom, you're in the band and, and you're playing your first gig. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Fun. Wow. What a, what, what a, but that's such an exciting thing that, you know, the, 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 the endorphins and everything going crazy when you're going to do a, a gig like that. I mean, that's very cool, man. Adrenaline. <laughs> that must have been fun. Oh, yeah. You know. Pure adrenaline. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's super. And then, and then you, and, and, and to pull it off and do it so well, you know, I mean, that's, uh, Some, it's remarkable. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love that. That's, that's great. Let's go back to Super Chunk. Uh, now we're, we're yeah. bouncing on. We were starting. Well, you know, Super Chunk. I'm, uh, you know, I, what's interesting when I, 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 I just got to tell you my my first experience with Super Chunk was, I was um, in Memphis, and I I don't know if I was recording. We were working at Arden, and I remember. I think I, I maybe I, we had a day off, or I just happened to be by just cruising around. There was this great punk club. It was a I don't know if it was punk, but. I walk in and Super Chunk was playing, but you were not drumming at the time. There was someone else playing drums, I, I believe. Um, what um, was not? It would have been ninety-two. I joined in ninety-one, and we definitely played the Antenna Club in. in oh, you know Memphis. what? Then you then you were drumming that night, <laughs> and it was killer. I remember. It I was can't. Packed. I can't. I can't believe you were there. I, mean, I was there. Just, Utterly mind blowing. Yeah, I wish I. I if wish you I, had I, known, I, Dave, yeah, know. that John was such well, a fan, you could have. I, I would have uh, went just... and said hello. We were, you know, I, I, I would have grabbed all the guys. I was there with Eric and Rob. I would have said, "Come on down." Oh. But I, we, we, uh, I was, and I remember walking back in the art and saying, "Like, I think we're doing this all wrong, fellas." <laughs> 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 you know, it was cool. I, it oh was, my god! Yeah, I mean, uh, little did you know, John, that, yeah. that, that the Hooters were in the audience that yeah, night. Yeah. That would have been. Sad. I was, I was knocked out. I remember, I was knocked That's out, crazy. but I didn't. Uh, for some reason, I'm doing. I don't know if it was Johnny playing, but uh, uh, it was very good. And I remember really being. Pr- good. It was like a little kit. It was you play like a small, like a you know, not a lot of drums. I remember it was it was just oh yeah a, four piece yeah which is four. the way to do it and uh, yep uh, I, it was just really really great I remember uh, and the audience was just over the moon as was I it was great it, it inspired me you know I had a, you know it's funny I don't know if you hung in Memphis but I remember I I went down to Beale Street and I sat in there was this guy Mel, Mason Ruffner who was a guitar player oh, yeah. and I and I Mason invited me to just sit in and. Hang out. It was such a great town. Like I think in one night I was like I saw you guys play and I went and played on Beale Street. It's like I'm never leaving wow. this place, you know. And then I thought, I looked around. And I said, Hey, man, I could get shot here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> crazy yeah, it's, town. It's se- several worlds going on at once. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, your your professional um, roots, John, kind of date back to. We, I'd started to mention this earlier that your first sign band, right, right profile. You worked with Jim Dickinson down in in Memphis, right? At Arden, at Arden, yeah. What um, so, the <laughs> my my leaving Psychotic Norman is is funny in that um, we 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 practiced in our in our bass player's uh, basement and things were just kind of not not happening at, at this point. So we're talking around December of '85, and the th- uh, three of the members showed up at his at his house to practice one Sunday. And he didn't show up at his own house. So, 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 so I took that as like, okay, I'm not sure if there's much of a future in this. And by chance, my brother, who is two years older, he was on a track scholarship to Wake Forest in Winston-Salem, wow. North Carolina. Oh. And he had become friends with this band there called The Right Profile. And uh, by chance, I had sent away for the Right Profiles single when I was in high school in 1984 because I loved that Southern pop stuff like R.E.M., yeah, right. Let's Act, the DBs. Oh, great and stuff, so, man. yeah, so they needed a drummer by chance. And mm. this just happened at the right moment where I was like annoyed enough with my own band that, <laughs> <laughs> that but I said, I'm going to try this. And my my dad gave me whatever hundred bucks to fly Piedmont Airlines down to <laughs> down to Winston, and I tried out. And yeah. for some reason, they wanted me in the band, even though like it, it was going from like being in in you know like a a pretty indie punk kind of band yeah. to the band. Like their their biggest influence was the band. Oh wow. So yeah. super stripped down Rolling Stones kind of stuff, which I loved, but yeah. I just had never played it really. Right. So uh-huh. 
that that's where I really learned how to play in a band. Yeah. A- and um, so by uh, amazingly, th- I think three months after I joined the band, I'm 19. We s- are in Clive Davis's office. Yeah. Um, who of course also signed Baby Grant. Yeah, sure. Uh, wow. And and, um, <laughs> and so we sign a record deal, and and I I had this dumb goal for myself that I set at like 15. If I'm not really happening by 20, I, I might I'll do something else. Uh, and some somehow it worked. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we sign, and you know I'm sure you know this in, in the world of major labels, it's just miles and miles of red tape you yeah. have to go through to get sure. anything done. Right. So we're signed for like at least nine months and <laughs> we can't get in the studio. Oh, we're doing man. all these de- all these demos right. and then finally Clive decrees that we can make a record. And right. so we we go uh first uh to Sam Phillips studio um also in Memphis. Yeah sure. And um uh, and it's Jim Dickinson yeah. And this guy named Roland James, who's the guitar player yeah. on all those super early Jerry Lee Lewis records. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. And he's the engineer, and he was just amazing. I bet. He looked like he looked like he was seventy yeah, then, and yeah. he he just died like ten years ago. Oh. <laughs> he was really forty at the time, right? He must have been. Oh, he must have been. Right, right, wow. And wow. and so then we we do the demos, and then we get to move up to Arden to yeah. do to do our record and it was it was, was jody working was jody working there back then jody? no no he he was around but he yeah. wasn't a strong presence there oh, okay. um mm. and so th- this was the record i think jim dickinson did right after the replacements pleased oh. to meet me oh and and so that was really exciting because i loved that record yeah and, sure um, and so he was great it was just at such a bizarre time in music it was 1987 mm. and you know th- this is yeah. the guy that played pia- piano on wild horses and is like yeah. such an organic guy yeah yeah and he, he he felt that he had to compete with whatever the new in excess single was oh. and mm. it just it was very quantized yeah and it just it just didn't work and Right. I was kind of the lone the, the lone voice that wanted to keep going because I I knew if we if we cut bait on that we would just kind of die in the water and and we did we oh. we ended up getting dropped dropped yeah. and so oh. that was my major label experience. Right, right. I read somewhere it's still a long way. You, I'm sorry, yeah. Dave. I'm just gonna say it's still a long way from working in a toothpaste factory. Yeah, <laughs> not better. Yes. Yeah. And and that's why I always keep in mind like whenever I'm doing something that's that is cool or I think is like an achievement, I'll always be thinking of that kid either in the the toothpaste factory yeah. or, you know, in, in the cornfield behind yeah. my house to sure. open things worked out. So, yeah, I, I saw it. somewhere that you, you, you did a record that Steve Jordan produced. Did, is that um, true? Yeah. Well, it, it was a session and oh. this is like the, the most life changing yeah. musical uh, uh, event in my life. Um, the right profile, we ended up getting dropped in like yeah. 80, maybe 88 or something. And, mm. We, we got a publishing deal with um, Warner Chapel Music, oh. a- and the woman who signed us was this was really great, and she knew what we were all about and who we were into, and she says you got to record with Steve Jordan, and and we were playing um, a show here in Chapel Hill, opening for Johnny Winter. We were like a <laughs> yeah. we were like like. Like Exile Era Stones meets The Replacements uh, me- meets The Heartbreakers. Johnny Thunders and The Heartbreakers. Right, so right. not a great pairing. <laughs> and uh, and Steve flew down to, to see us. And he had just seen The Stones' first show of the Steel Wheels tour, which was at the Vet. Right. Yeah. And uh, and he was really excited about that. And he was he was just so cool. Yeah. And w- we ended up hanging out, and we ended up doing – this five song session at um, the hit factory and Nico Bolas was the engineer and um, (laughs) pretty good. And he he was great. And so, um, but Nico thought we were, we were rubes because we were from the South. So he, he hired like 30 hay bales from the, the police stable where they keep the horses. (laughs) And brought them into the studio. Oh, great! <laughs> and so we were we were kind of insulted, but we also thought it was genius. Yeah. And so we would, uh, for pre-production, we would go to Steve's apartment, 
Um, and he had this whole floor of an apartment. I can't imagine yeah. he doesn't still live there because it was such a cool place. I think he, yeah, I think he does. I think he, <laughs> he does. I think he, yeah, yeah, I, I've heard about that place, yeah. And he, he, he would have us over, and I, and I would play on like a, a tiny kit and, and these little practice amps, and it's like two in the morning, too. Yeah. So, and and uh, he, he would, he, he would rouse us by going, like, yeah, we're going to play it like two. Come on, we're rockers. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. so we'd go over, and um, he he was so great because he would never – he never said, here, get up, and I'll show you how to do this. It was yeah. all just yeah. kind of osmosis. I just soaked up whatever he had, yeah. and he was so calming. Yeah. I was I was at a, a weird personal part of my life too, and, um, and he was so great about that. And so we moved to the Hit Factory – and to this day, I think it's maybe the best stuff I've ever played on. Wow. It just wow. sounded so good. Yeah. And, and I, do you remember that great performance, Neil Young rocking in the free world? Yes, on, with, on with, Char Sarah, Sarah with Charlie playing. Charlie was playing drums that night, and Steve was playing bass. Um, other way. Uh, was it? Charlie oh. was on bass. Yeah. Oh, oh really? They, sw they switched when, when they played with Keith. Oh, um, there you go. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Uh, Switched. I, think, I love it. <laughs> um, to, to the best of my knowledge, the, the kit I played on this session he produced is that kit. Like wow. this is 20, yeah. 28 inch vintage bass drum, and it just sounded amazing. I bet. And, and he, he would stand just in the room with us, yeah. shaking a tambourine, like to keep the tempo, yeah. but also to kind of like keep the vibe, the vibe yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Yeah. And yeah. To this day, it's it's the the I most bet. I've ever learned yeah i uh, bet in my I, life. I read that and i was like wow what a great experience you know i mean yeah. I, i'm such a fan i'm a fan of yours i'm a fan of steve's man i i i, I, I oh, love yeah. him I, lo I love you know just the way he just sits on a drum set you know oh, it's yeah. not like you know he's just it's just poetry emotion and and you know the groove and the sound and everything. We were close, Dave, to getting Steve Jordan on, well, the, on the podcast. Be, yeah. I mean, we still got a shot at some he'll point. Come back. Yeah, <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll come back. He'll come. But but uh, but Johnny, you know, like he, he, so afterwards, you were uh, you were flying, and uh, but you know, your play your playing reflects, you know, just uh, just incredible um, energy and spirit. It's really nice, man. Um, well, thank it, you. Yeah, it really is really, really great. Uh, what are you doing? I mean, uh, are you, you're do doing a lot of – well, with this COVID period, what, how are you staying in it? Like, what are you doing? Well, not as much as I would like. Yeah, but, um, sure. But now, the, the only band that's been super active to the degree that we can be is um, the Mountain Goats. And um, we, we will do these um, – these live sessions at a local recording studio that by chance is set up for video. So we'll, oh. we'll I think we've, we've done four of these things where we'll do a, a almost like a, a live set. Yeah. And, and people can, you know, can buy the pass to see it on online. And yeah. so that's, that's pretty much it really yeah. super chunk. We've been pecking away at a record in, in a basement. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Very and, good, uh, good. That's about it. I got to uh, ask you, the, yeah. I got to ask you, John, about the Mountain Goats, the video for uh, Get Famous, where oh. you guys are all being played by bobbleheads. Were you, uh, you yes. happy? Were you happy with you as a bobblehead? Did, were you happy with the way your bobblehead turned out? Yes, yes. Although, although I, I had issues with the drum kit, but but uh, <laughs> you know that that can't be helped. <laughs> the drum, the drum, the drum kit looks like a chair. I think. <laughs> okay. If you haven't seen it, folks, it's a great video. It's it's a song "Get Famous" by the Mountain Goats, and and the whole band is being played, as I said, by bobbleheads. What was the? Uh, <laughs> do you know what the uh, reason for that was? Was it who, was it the director's idea, or did the band want that? It was the director's idea, and it was it was just a great idea that could be done you know, under, under the circumstances we were under. So, right. you know, we, we didn't have to be there. Right. You know, this, 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 the fact that you're as active as you are through this whole year, um, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable, you know, because it's really uh, changed. Like, you know, I just look at my situation with the Hooters and like we were, what things that we were going to do and, 
you know, we're, mm-hmm. I, I hate to say that we, you know, we're coming to an end, but when you do a 40th anniversary tour, you know, that's, that's a long time to be doing. We're going to do that now with now. I think when we go out, eventually go out, it's going to be the, you know, 40 plus, it'll be like 42 years, you know? Right. So right. It, it is a long time. And the, that, the fact that you, I mean, you brought up Bobby and John, like lately I've been at this point where I, been seeing a lot of photos um, uh, uh, of, of my, my early years, and I and before I John and Bob played with that version of the Hooters, I played in three bands with both those guys. And John Kuzman was my like my big brother. You know, we lived in an apartment together. And uh, wow, I mean, but we were real. Like, do you remember City Gardens? Did you used to play City Gardens? Oh yeah, I I only what played a, there once, but, wow. but I, I saw I saw some good shows there for sure. Great. Place. Who'd you play with at City Gardens? Was that Super was, was that was Super yeah. Chunk? Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like it was it was kind of close to to bef- right before it closed. Yeah. Maybe. So we're, we're talking like ninety three, maybe. Yeah. yeah, that was towards the oh. end. Yeah, that was. I yeah. saw some great shows there. Hey, by the way, you know, let me mention. You know, um, you mentioned the Clash and that record. I when we played with the Clash and the Who at JFK Stadium in eighty two. Topper wasn't with them. Um, I forget the drummer's name that replaced him for a little bit. Terry but, uh, Chimes. Yes, Terry Chimes. Yes. And I remember, and he did a great job, but I remember mm-hmm. I was so disappointed because, you know, Topper, uh, I guess he was, you know, we, we both had, like, I, 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 I related to him a bit. I was sad because he, he kind of, we both had these nasty addictions with heroin, and he he did, apparently, and, and at the time he couldn't, just couldn't work, and... Um, and I remember I, I, I wanted to meet him. <laughs> I wanted to meet him really bad. Yeah. Um, but we had this great hang um, backstage there uh, uh, and, and just watching Joe Strummer get a haircut. <laughs> and you uh, just a- it was you great. just answered one of the questions I'd written down for you if you had any inter- interaction with them that day. Yeah, a little bit, you know. Do you remember the guy, Cosmo, the guy that used to hang oh, yeah. out? Yeah, it was Cosmo and Joe. Um, yeah, a little bit. Paul was very nice. You know, they, they were the punk. They were like, you, 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 I remember they were just so raw when they hit the stage. And it yeah. was so refreshing um, because that's what we were, you know, at the time. We, we didn't know, like I, I didn't know. And I had a little Gretsch kit. It just happened to have two Toms on the top, you know, but it was this Gretsch Charlie kit uh, with, with an extra Tom. And I remember we were raw. And I liked them so much because they were, you know, they came out and they were just, you know, one, two, three, four, boom. And then, you know, I think they opened, they probably opened with London Calling, uh, mm-hmm. but they did all the great shit. And it was, uh, and we, we missed, we missed the who, because we had a gig down in, 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 in Richmond, Virginia, which I'm sure used to play down there. I, I, we, I, I never minded because they were such a progressive town and they loved the ska thing there was a band down there called the good guys um okay, they, sure. yeah, do you remember them and they were really yeah. cool and i remember i remember the guys in the band came to see the next version of the hooters and they were standing on the side we were playing somewhere and they were like they looked at me and they were like so disappointed <laughs> with me and we were like why and i said you know it just wasn't working and they're like yeah but that other thing was so fresh and right. real and i said yeah but this is real too it's just real in a different way i don't know if you've ever experienced that you know but you know sometimes when you know that's one thing about being in a band for a long time and you sometimes you morph into something else and people that are used to something else look at it and go what are you doing and you know i remember getting that from those guys like yeah. you well, change everything a similar thing. I had a similar experience with you guys. I, I saw you open for the Go-Go's and In Excess of uh, a Man. Oh, man. Right. And that was the first I'd, I'd seen you since the sort of transformation, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're like, yeah. but we did open with Pete Rose that night, uh, which I don't remember. We, I don't know if we did bomb. We, might have, did we, we probably didn't do Bomb Scare there. But we, but well, we, but we Pete did. Rose? Pete Rose was a song that was another ska, and, and it all there. Every Johnny, every song was, uh, everything was that. And I had the snare drum without a head on the left side that I always would play, and it had this, and it was warped, and it, but the rim was bent, and I mean, I always the dread snare, the dread snare, exactly. Hit the dread snare, and boom, and Pete Rose was a song. You know, it, 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 back then it was always the B 
Pete Rose, you know, like we, oh. you know what I mean? And, that, and, that, and it was like John would be all over the stage. There was no like rhyme. The, the the rhythm was just basically what we were feeling that day, and it was raw and real. And you know, I I think you probably experienced that with your fans. Like when you go out, and just like let's kill it. I, I remember afterwards, you know, uh, um, like becoming more conscious about time. <laughs> okay, yeah. got to play in time. <laughs> I mean, I was oh, always trying, yeah. but you know, but there was something beauty to the, to like the 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 rawness, watching a crowd and just going with them, and you know, uh, we were less we were less serious, <laughs> although yeah. always serious. I don't know if you get I know what I mean by that. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Wow, you were at that show. I remember hanging um, that NX uh, show, and I, I became pretty good friends with uh, John Ferris, the drummer yes. in NXS. And we, we'd hang out. I remember Gary invited me to go fishing with him in Australia. And, wow. and, 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 but I remember seeing Michael um, depressed, like really like... He, I, yeah. I, and so when, when all that went down with him... Later on, I, I was not surprised because I saw him have like here was this they were they were they were adored. You know how he was adored. They, the women were going nuts over him. And right. and then but the guy couldn't seem to find any joy in any of it. Um, sure. And then, you know, obviously what what happened to his tragic ending of his life, you know, mm -hmm. but um I don't know. I didn't want to, but it was great that you were there. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and speaking of of Australia, one of one of the great calming moments of, of my life on tour. I, I was in Perth, Australia. This is this is maybe maybe eight years ago. Wow. And, you know, as far away from home as you can be. Yeah. You and are. I, I was in a vintage a vintage clothing store. All you zombies came on. <laughs> no shit. I wow. couldn't believe it. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> That was a big, yeah, that was a big one over there. I mean, we got to do Molly Meldrum's show, and we, wow. you know, it was weird though. You know, this is where you go where management companies. You're thinking, why the fuck did you send us back there? I mean, we really had a mar we went there, and it just like sometimes it, it's, you know, it's far, and it's expensive to take care yeah. of that kind of stuff. But I don't yeah. think you know our manager was like, well, unless the record company is going to support it, we're not going to do it. And, you know, I, I was I like the fact that you were there eight years ago makes me go. Oh, I would have loved to go back because I loved it there. There's so still time. Great. There's still time. Dude. Yeah, there's still sure, time. Yeah. Hey, we we, we got to get. We're, we're running out of time, and there's so much more that we got to talk with. I love to, having to guests John like about, Johnny because yeah. he's yeah. The com the comedy thing is what blows well, I, my mind. I want to get to that, but I do. I, we need to ask about this because you've played with all these super cool indie, you know. People through the years, Ben Gibbard, Jay Farrar, Robert Pollard, uh, Alejandro Escavada. You sent a great track from Alejandro Castanets. I love that song. We're not going to have time to play it, but so you've played with all these, you know, kind of left of center people, you know, as far as you know, left of the dial kind of thing. But yet you've also played, you've also backed up Katy Perry at the MTV Video Awards, <laughs> and I, I got to ask how that happened. Because that is so out of your, your normal Balouac. Uh, how, how do you end up? I heard she's up? very nice, too. Oh, I mean, she's, yeah. She okay. was super nice. Yeah. yeah, she was very nice. This would have been uh, uh, 09, and I was living up in Brooklyn. And one day I, I get this call from a guy I kind of knew, and he said, I'm putting together this drum section for Katy Perry at, at, the, um, at the VMAs at Radio City Music Hall. Would you want to do it? And I just said, I can't not do that. I, that has to be something. <laughs> yeah. Right. I gotta see what this is. <laughs> and, you said no and, before you even knew what it was, right? It's like, I mean, you said yes. You said yes before you I'm, knew what it was. I'm doing right? this. <laughs> yes. and, and, and so basically, it was it was her doing "We Will Rock You" by Queen. Oh, cool. And it it, it was just a, um, a drummer who had a kit, and he and, and he also got the original stamp, stomp samples and clap samples from Queen. So oh, he's, wow. He, he's kind of tr triggering those and playing a, a beat. And then maybe four of us, I was on a bass drum, a guy was on a timpani, another bass drum and a timpani. And, yeah. And for the solo, Joe Perry from Aerosmith. Right, yeah. And so the day before we did it, it's, ju it's like 10 in the morning on a Sunday morning, and mm. it's us dirtbags, Katy Perry and Joe Perry in a, in a little – rehearsal room it was like you just can't you just can't like wow make that up that's cool uh, so that's what that was yeah that, that's very cool did that's you get to talk cool. to her at all yeah a little bit um mm. um she was super nice yeah that's um heard. yeah yeah she was great 
that, that that's a good good story. Um, and as the, the comedy, I mean, as they've they brought up the comedy, we mentioned you're this a so little bit funny, at the man. beginning of the you're show. Very funny. You've been doing, you've been working with Tom Sharpling for, I guess, uh, you know, twenty some years now, doing the best show with with him. Um, and you guys met, I guess, at a Super Chunk show. He was in the audience, or. Yes, he he um he was actually a, a friend and a fan of Super Chunk before I joined the band. So I joined in um, September of '91, and we played this show at uh, it, it used to be Studio 54, and for a brief time it was called the Ritz in um, oh, yeah. New York. Right. Um, not the original Ritz, but it was uh, a different one. For yeah, a little right. bit. And oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it, it was My Bloody Valentine, this super loud indie band from England, uh, a band called Pavement and Us. And um, Tom came to that show, and we just hit it off over, over comedy. We both loved that Chris Elliott show, Get a Life. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what, where we kind of hit it off. And we just started talking on the phone every day for a couple of years. Yeah. And then Tom ended up having a, a radio show on WFMU in East Orange, New Jersey. Yeah. And sure. we just started doing these fun calls where I would call in as this complete idiot character. And... <laughs> And we tried to try to get people to believe it. And often they did. And people would call in and argue with my character. <laughs> and it just it just went from there. And we still do. I did a call last night, like 20 some years later. Oh, that's uh, what, what, char- what, happening. What, what character were you playing last night? Last night was uh, it was actually two characters in, in, in one. It was a guy that, that uh, called Tom to uh, first a, as a father who was complaining about Tom yelling at his son <laughs> and then revealing way too much information about the son. And then the son calling back as this, a, a, to, to yell at Tom for being mean to his father. <laughs> and then a, a, a third call where it's revealed they're, they're the, the same person. Uh, so you played both <laughs> the son and the father. Oh, man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and uh, I can't go without saying – the main character I do is this guy named Philly Boy Roy. Right? Yes, right, right. He, yes. He's from Roxborough, and whenever he calls in, his his intro music is the, the beginning of And We Dance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? Can you give us, not to put you, you know, on the spot. You know, I totally forgot that can we you were going to do something with that. Can you give us a little Philly Boy Roy? Oh, please. Uh, you know, the Hooters was always too scared to play in Roxborough, so they would, they would play... They would just play in Center City, you know, on the other side of the road. I, 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 I played with a guy who, who had friends who called, I guess, Broad Street the road. Like, you didn't go on the other side of the road. Road. <laughs> oh, Philly boy. Roy, that's great. Well, the very the, 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 the very first, for people who don't know, the very first call in that, that John did with, with Tom was a character named Ronald Thomas Clontel. And he wrote this book, uh, uh, this music, the definitive, uh, the definitive book of music to settle all arguments. And the book was Rock, Rot, or Rule. And he basically would just pick bands and say whether they rocked, rotted, or ruled. And there, there was no, and, and it was based on a survey of people in Kansas and Florida. That was the extent of the, <laughs> the Gainesville, Florida, and Lawrence, Kansas is oh where he got his. God. And he did like a 45 minute interview as this legitimate author. Yeah. And it was just inane. He said that madness invented ska. Yeah. Uh, that was he said David Bowie rotted because he <laughs> changed too many too many changes. Oh, but man. it was but people were calling in and getting all pissed off because yeah. they thought you were real. They yeah. thought you were real. I love it. it, was, I love it. it well, was, that's authentic, man. When you can get people <laughs> pissed, you know, and you're doing it. You hit, uh, yeah, you certainly hit the ground running with that amazing. one. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. When are we going to see you in some movies, Johnny? Um, you know, I, I Tom and I shot a scene, but we're cut out of the. Uh, of the last Ant Man movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> will that show up in the director's cut or something? It, it didn't. It oh. did not. Oh, okay. no, <laughs> no. Um, but um, I appeared in an episode of uh, of this really fun show that Fred Armisen and 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 Bill Hader and Seth Seth Meyers had called um, Documentary Now, and ah. they would do these these fake. Uh, Fake documentaries based on actual actual ones, and they did one that was so good. Uh, it was a spoof of Stop Making Sense, the Talking Heads film, oh. <laughs> and, and I mean, it looks just like it. And Fred and Bill are, are the two two guys in the band. Uh, Maya Rudolph was another member, and I was the drummer. Oh wow! And and, uh, and so I had some lines, and, I, and and they kept the lines in, and that was just really fun. Oh, was, I it bet. It was a super super yeah. fun one, and, and I'm yeah. sure that's still. 
viewable somewhere. Yeah, I'll but, try to find well, it. Well, in I addition mean, I love to it. all yeah. of John's music, which you can find on all the major streaming sites and uh, download sites, uh, your comedy's out there too. It's on Spotify. And I know, like, uh, about five, six years ago, some company put out like a 16 C- CD box set of your uh, The Best of Sharpling and Worcester. So I, I don't know if that's still out there for people to, to hunt down, but. Uh, I, They might all be gone, but they might. They might a, a few could be out there. Yes, I yeah. was amazed that they, they 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 actually sold out. As far mm-hmm. as I know, that's so. we never touched on this. And, was, and Johnny, I hope you'll come back sometime because it's been a real pleasure. But okay. I want to ask you, how did you end up down in uh, Chapel Hill? Um, I played in that band, The Right Profile, oh, that, okay. that was signed to Arista. Right, and, and then after that Steve Jordan session, yeah, we kind of just put, puttered out. It had gone as long as it was going to go, right. and. Um, we we did this death march tour, <laughs> in hopes of getting of getting signed, oh. uh, like, and and the dates were Atlanta, Lubbock, Texas, nothing in between, no. and, and, um, Las Cruces, and uh, L A. Oh boy, uh, for for a couple showcases, death march back, and <laughs> nothing came of it. I I think I returned with two dollars, and oh. amazingly. I stopped off at, at, at where my brother works in Chapel Hill. I'd already moved here, but I didn't have anything going. I'd been here for about four months. Yeah. A- and he said, hey, Mac from Super Chunk called. Oh. And I was like, please be what I hope it is. <laughs> and he, he said, they dr- they were something was up with the drummer. It wasn't yeah. happening. Yeah. Would you want to join? I was like, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll be right over. That. Good yes. for you. Well, that's a great that's uh, lead into this because we can't let John go without hearing at least a little super chunk. Um, we have from their 2018 album yes. the title track, What a Time to Be Alive. Uh, in 2018, I guess that would be <laughs> more true than in 2020, but yeah. Uh, yeah. let's hear a little super chunk. So good, you know. Um, I love listening to you play on records. I love, I love it. I got, I got, I got, I got out to see you play live when it all comes back again. But oh yes, this time I'll come say hello. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I didn't know, but I still can't time. believe you. Yeah, were, we're there. So mind blowing. Yeah, <laughs> was there? What was there? Antenna. I, I could. I rem- now I eat like the club. I remember the name of the club, but I, I mean I couldn't remember it was a place until you brought it up. I was like, that was it. It was cool. That's it. It was off the main drag. It wasn't too far from Arden. I remember it was like not too far from the studio. Yeah, the um, the, the Mountain Goats made a record at Sam Phillips uh, last year, a- yeah. and um, it's still there. The, yeah. the antenna. Wow. Hey, did you know Joe Hardy by chance? He was uh, he was there, and I'm trying to remember if he. I don't think he was the engineer. John yeah. Hampton was the engineer. Yes. But yep. but I remember talking to Joe Hardy because it was it was happened to be when he was redoing those ZZ Top records. Yes. So he, he yeah. had the track sheets out. Right. And yeah. so that was really exciting. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had that weird board. Remember going in that bit room at Arden and the board was the the console was turned and it wasn't facing the window, it was facing the other. And do you remember the Russian That's dragon? Right. Do you remember the Russian dragon? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great. The Russian. Yep. It was a, a, Andy. It was a light that would show you. It, it was great. You were either Russian or you were dragon. It was. <laughs> the, the Hardy was like, you, you look at that. <laughs> it was great. It was. It was great. It, we're in a great place, man. You know. Yeah. I remember the barbecue. The, the Harry's barbecue butt sandwiches across the street were always really. Oh good. my God! Yes. Remember those? Yep. They were good. Hey, yep. J- yep. John. John, before we let you go, I got to ask: Do you have any good Robert Pollard stories? 
Well, he and I share the same birthday. I think I think we're exactly ten years apart, and um, um, he is he's he's a one of a kind guy. And um, I did it. I did it probably nine months playing with him on his first solo uh, outing, and oh my god, these songs were so hard, and there were fifty of them, and right, right. they're of course. they're all they're all short, but they've all got like five to seven parts that that repeat maybe one or or, or a uh, half a time oh my god so oh my god the math involved in this was just crazy but <laughs> but what was so impre- impressive about him is that i mean he would drink oh, yeah. during these shows and you know he'd start off with and, and you know this is this is not secret no knowledge at, at all but like you know he he would he'd be pretty toasted <laughs> before the show he wouldn't sound check with us we would do the sound check without him and uh he would drink straight tequila during the show and then have some after, but during the show, he never messed up a lyric. I mean, he would slur, but he never, and we're talking like, we're talking like a dictionary's worth of words. <laughs> right. a, a, a of course. Yeah. Those songs are. Yeah. It, yeah. So he insane. Um, but the, the big story of, of my time with him was that, we were rehearsing for the first leg of it, and uh, our guitar player Tommy Keen, uh, the late great, had, had a great, yes. yes, had a great solo career. He was the guitar player, and Dave Phillips, who also just passed away, he was the guitar player also, and um. Jason Narducci was the bassist. And we went to rehearse, and we were staying at at, uh, at Tommy's, and I was a pretty pretty good drinker back then, a- and um, I was sitting with Tommy and his dog. <laughs> on the couch watching some sort of video and you know i probably had four sierra nevadas in me at this point and the dog was super nice and i leaned in and said aren't you a good girl and she bit me right in the face oh, oh my god, god. <laughs> like in the face and, and oh. it was, it was, i couldn't but well, an instant <laughs> shock and i went down and i looked in the mirror i was like no because oh. uh, your, fa- your face is oh. just different oh what kind of and, dog and, was it? it it was an irish springer spaniel oh. and, what'd you oh, say to she, piss off the dog you said uh, you're aren't you a good girl tried to kiss her i guess <laughs> oh and, my god and, and so I, I i go tommy and he goes oh my god and he he got his partner and yeah. his partner uh mike such a great guy stitch you he, up <laughs> he Ran me down to Cedar Sinai, yeah. and they did stitch me up. But so for the rest of the rehearsal, I just had like, I looked like Frankenstein. <laughs> and and then we played shows, and I was still I was still had a big wow. scar. Wow. And we're playing in Louisville, wow. uh, or across the river, across the river from Cincinnati. Um, yeah. I can't remember the n- name of the town, but it's right across. So it's Bo- it's Pollard's hometown gig, pretty much. Wow. We're playing, and at some point. I get hit in the in the same spot where I got bitten uh, with a, a a beer in a can, and, oh it, and like it hurt, but it was like so. I just we just thought it was so ridiculous that wow. of all the people in the band to get hit, it's me right where I got bitten. Oh boy! And and after the song, I I went out and I I I never do something like this. I grabbed Bob's mic out of his hand and I said, "Please don't hit. Stop <laughs> throwing beer on the stage." And, and Bob goes. <laughs> Yeah, don't hit John with any beer. He's cool. How'd it go? He's cool. Well, listen, man, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us. It was, it was a real pleasure. Uh, people were excited about you coming on, and uh, it's it, truly nice to meet you. And, and again, like I said, when I come see you, I'm going to come say hello. <laughs> I would love it. And yeah, it was wonderful. Seriously, such you're such a, uh, an influence on me and oh, that whole you. era. It was wow. such a huge part of my life, so wow. it's great to talk to you. Great. John, this was great. Thank you so much. Is there, do you have a website where, where people can go to just check out what you got going on or anything that uh, you no, want to – uh, um, it's all on John Worcester on Instagram or Facebook yeah. or okay. or Twitter. Yeah, yeah, so everything's out there. Excellent. All right, the great, great John Worcester. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Thank this you, was Johnny. a blast. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I all appreciate right. it. All right. all right. Wonderful. He's great, right? Well, he knew he'd be great, and he absolutely was. Yeah. Um, all right, well, that will Another. wrap it up this week. Uh, yeah. Episode 87 in the books. Right. Thanks, right. as always, to Wildfire Radio and to Taylor. Thanks to Croker Percussion. Remember, if you go on their website and yeah. you, you crokerpercussion.com backslash ITP, you'll get a 5% uh, coupon for anything in the store. 
Thanks to our friends at the School of Rock Main Line. Thanks again to the fantastic John Worcester. Go find his music, his comedy. It's all out there all over the Very internet. Uh, for Dave, I'm Andy. We'll see you next time on In the Pocket. Yikes.